Are we an early adapter? Are, are we part of that late majority? Are, are we a lagger? Just because our practice is brand new doesn't mean it's going to embrace some of these features, you know, they're... Well, welcome to Optometry Profits Revealed, the future of the eye care industry. I'm your host, Peter Precht. And today we're going to have a conversation with Cesar Rodriguez. He's a 22 year experienced optician with experience in retail, private practice, and ophthalmology. He's the former membership chair of the Opticians Association of Ohio. And it's wonderful to see you. It's wonderful to see you too, Peter. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, you and I met via LinkedIn. And um, I think that's that's kind of ultimately going to connect back to the end of our discussion uh, that, you know, technology is uh, it's pretty amazing how we can connect with one another. I'm also the membership chair on uh, the Optician Association of Pennsylvania. So, you know, we had some things in common to connect about and, and talk about regarding membership. You know, we're brand new. You guys have been around a little bit. So, in some ways, apples and oranges. But um, I know you and I had talked briefly about a, a pretty large chasm that exists out there. And this is overall, I think, across all of uh, the optical industry. And I'll let you elaborate on that. Tell me, tell me your thoughts on what that chasm is and, and where we're heading. There's an overwhelming cry for change within the industry. And the, the young folks are, are chomping at the bit. They want to step up. They want to use technology. They right. want to implement the only way they know how to operate in this world, and it's the use of, of, of technology. And right. you mentioned we met via LinkedIn. I think there was right. a comment of some sort that you had made, and I commented back, and that was the beginning of a handful of phone calls and right here we are using technology you know right. and I, I only see the use of technology growing um for those who right. want to and can implement it it's inevitable which brings me to to um and some folks are aware of this some are not but it's the diffusion of innovation theory social science is based yes and there was a Boston University study that was just done. Uh, that's an E.M. Rogers theory uh, that you and I have, have talked about before. And it it centers around the introduction of, of technology, uh, like you mentioned, and how it's received. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and it's, it, it's fascinating, actually. It, it's not only an, a helpful guide uh, to those of us that are out there, you know, really selling uh, products uh, specifically to independent practices, but but to any anyone in a sales environment yeah. in our industry, uh, behind the scenes or up front, the technology introduction is is coming at a <laughs> really <laughs> fast rate. So you know that's part of the, the, the I think part part of the uh, issue shall we say but you know you talked about early adapters you know the late majority and laggers do you have that pulled up is it I up do that or? yes thank you for those who don't know about the diffusion of innovation theory i'll just read a little bit about it and what it uh, theorizes in in this study but um, just at the very beginning, this is the diffusion of innovation theory developed by E.M. Rogers was done back in 1962. It's one of the oldest social science theories. It originated in communication to explain how, over time, an idea or product gains momentum and diffuses or spreads through a specific population or social system. The end result of this diffusion is that people, as a part of a social system, adopt a new idea behavior or product. Adoption means that that person does something differently than what they had previously, i.e. purchase or use a new product and acquire a new behavior. 
The key to adoption is that the person must perceive the idea, behavior, or product as a new, as new or innovative. It is thought that this is dif that this diffusion is possible. So, that being said, there's uh, technology out there with the remote or mobile uh, fractions. Right. Before we had started, I had shared a story with with you about my daughter and how she was in the emergency room and how. Right. I didn't have to fill out any paperwork. I didn't have to do anything. I just verified the information because all of our information was portable. There was an administrator that came into the room, verified identity and uh, insurance. And once that was accomplished, everything proceeded. Bing, bing, boom. You're, you're, you're going forward. So convenient. Right. And so from my understanding with these, um, mobile refractions or remote refractions the concept right. is very similar everything is all in a digital format and it's portable so i don't have a very deep understanding on it but i do know that there are some positives to it right. you know and there's there's a handful of retailers that are rolling it out well it sounds like a centralized file for the individual and as long as it's hipaa compliant and the patient agrees Right. Well, and right. And that's, that's, um, HIPAA in motion. Exactly. Right. It is because of the portability aspect of it. It's Correct. exactly you got right. It. right. Which is, you know, something that <laughs> I guess was maybe foretold or, you know, when, when, when HIPAA was, was introduced, I, I guess, you know, so that, that's, that's nice to see it functioning in, in a positive way. Cause it was certainly a thorn for a lot of us when it was, to your point, in this diffusion of, of innovation, there's the innovators. Right. The ones that roll it out, the visionaries that, you know, like the Steve Jobs is and stuff, right? right? And then the next group are the early adapters, the ones that, that see that and can picture this in motion, if you will, down the road and will get in line and stand in line until it rolls out. Yeah, they can see the vision. They, know, they see they see the technology's use now and forward uh, immediately, and that's pretty cool. You know, a, a tip of the hat to your early adapters. But I'll let you keep going. So yeah, so your your early adapters or early adopters, excuse me, will right. see the vision and they'll spread it to the masses. It's like, hey, there's this really cool technology. Check right. it out. You know, this is what it does. And they have a, a graph kind of like you and I, if you will, you right. know, where we see where things are going and right. we're talking about it. And then right. you have some of the early majority where they will, they're curious. It's like, well, maybe I should try if, if there's some people already trying it. Well, I want to be part of it too. Right. And so that's a growing, a growing part of the, um, the population that get involved and start practicing it and, exactly. it and utilizing it. And so now what comes, what happens is market share starts to grow within society. Right. right. And then that spreads over into the next group of the late majority, or as I like to call that the FOMO group. They've seen it. They've, uh, now they can, now it's proven. Okay. Oh, now I can latch on to this because yep, there's, there's it's that real. fear of missing out. There's a living example somewhere for me to connect to kind of thing. Right. And so once, once they get on, you have mass market share, you have a, a very large population practicing it, involving it in their everyday uh, lifestyle, if you will. Right. Right. And then that, that just brings in your, your laggards. The ones it's like, well, Everybody else is doing it. I may as well, too. Lack of choice. Um, can't deny. Oh, well, I'm going to have to do this now. <laughs> right. Which, you know, and I understand. I certainly can connect with the different levels of this. But I think it's kind of a interesting topic for not just if we connect this with independent optometry, you know, for them to rate themselves as a practice, where, where would I fall in, you know, are we an early adapter? Are, are we part of that late majority? Are, are we a lagger? 
and it's not all predicated on you know there's other factors that that just because a practice is brand new doesn't mean it's going to embrace some of these features you know there there are practices that are 25 and 30 years old that are highly innovative and they're always at the forefront always introducing new technology and you know you know so we can see some of these these boys as they separate here and there uh you know in, in a very obvious way but it it's also a good idea for these folks to help um self-assess you know where where they do stand you know mm -hmm. and because technology enables people to do their job and do and focus on doing their job well from a craftsman standpoint from a you know a sales standpoint from a sales relationship standpoint it, it's not it's not cut and dry you know optician work like we, we, we talked about this a few times optician work carries an ethic with it and you know there's an understanding there uh, that some gather and some connect directly with sales, you know, and then there's other elements that we also talked about where people are certainly out there mentioning things like, you know, an optician's job can get highly sidetracked, um, with ancillary responsibility, you know, responsibilities of pricing things out that honestly have nothing to do with the recommendations that they ought to be making to a patient. And, Hopefully technology can get in there and do these kind of things. And the large part of the reason that we're doing this type of podcast is to make sure that these types of innovations, your VTO, the virtual scripts, um, the, the products that are eliminating the insurance wasted time and effort that an optician has to figure out rather than giving their full attention to the patient. I mean, and there's, and there's, there's technology out there being developed right. um, by opticians for opticians. Right. And, you know, it's, it's really cool to see that number one, it's identified. Number two, there's a solution being offered. Right. And exactly. whose responsibility is it to, to roll these out and, and, you know, adapt the, or adopt these, these innovations. It's us as opticians. It's, it's the truth. The opticians are, they have that role because they are actively watching what they do be erased. We're watching prescriptions walk out the door with PDs. Mm -hmm. Everybody I talk to doesn't deny this. And it's, it, it, it's something that is very, very real. So, so a practice, a practice that's willing to embrace, you know, collaboration with VTO, with uh, remote frame styling, with, you know, right. remote problem solving for their opticians, giving, giving their opticians an opportunity to create a business within a business. You know, that's thinking out of the box. Um, right. That's not traditional. And um, these are the types of products that are going to be, you know, utilized by your early adapters. And, you know, when they demonstrate that they're, making money with this up oh, then that late majority is going to start to join and i think it depends on the type of product that we are talking about you know because obviously frames are different lenses are different you know mm -hmm. the engagement we know is absolutely different and changing every minute it isn't easy to always assess where you sit on that spectrum right, you know right. for uh, not just as an optician but you know, as a, as a practice or, or how you, how you manage or how you look at things going forward. Well, there, there was a certain event about three years ago that accelerated this. And we all know that 2020 was right. uh, an accelerator and a catalyst, if you will, for technology, because, right. you know, it, it changed everything. And those who utilized it or were on the fence and started to utilize it are way in leaps and bounds ahead of the game. Right because they were already curious. And then the general public were, were already using it behind the scenes. That's why the PDs were walking out right. and buying exactly. had changed within that. And so the ones right. that, you know, were doing their things online, they didn't have to change anything. It was already a thing for them. It's like, so how do we implement that within our own uh, practice? Right. You know, and 
there's there's a cry out there from the population that they want technology to be used. How do we offer it to them? Right. You know, and there's a lot of 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 need from the general public, and we need to fulfill that. Completely. And you know, the 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 like you said, those that were poised pre pandemic were all better to 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 be able to adapt, you know. Mm-hmm. with sterilizing frames and all the other interesting things that, you know, not just masks, you know, what's a frame just... look like with a mask on? What's it look like without a mask on? You're right. There was so many interesting bridges that all of us had to cross. <laughs> and how, what are we going to do again? Is this the last time we're going to deal with this? Do we really think that, you know, so, so you're right. You know, there, there is this, this, um, and, and, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. you know, to, to right. coin the phrase, but, but it is, it's, it's very easy to look back and be, and be critical of, of certain practices and things that took place and things that didn't take place and how, how staff was integrated or, or not in some of these decisions, you know, how you manage things in the future is completely relevant to the introduction of technology and how you embrace it at what stage, depending on where your practice is. Uh, right. It's huge. It's completely huge. And outside of work, you know, through the uh, Opticians Association, we identified the, the, the need for technology and we created a Zoom account and we had more board meetings uh, virtually than we did in person Uh, just simply because it's more convenient because you know you don't have to leave your house you just have to have a time commitment uh, to get on and we had more and what that enabled us to do is become stronger as an organization or as an association and that spiraled into including the zoom uh for our continuing education events yep, for, and for not CDs. only do you have, yep. can you have the option to sit live with everybody else but when we rolled it out it was one of those comfortability things it's like well i'm not quite comfortable going in public yet so i'll right. just join via zoom and right. you get that same education and right it's you know attendance is down but is it because we have virtual attendees also right i I think that's a really important topic to hit on too, because the not only does the virtual give the ability to expand it out beyond, but because the technology has been being used in the last three years, there is greater attendance virtually. I really believe that. I also think it's easier to get the word out. You know, I'll be attending uh, the Northeast Optical Show, and this is their third year, and. You know, they're looking at having over 300 people on a Sunday afternoon Mm -hmm. in September. You know, people are going to miss football for this. (laughs) They're going to miss football for this. Right. right. (laughs) And I'm I'm eager to go and see uh, what's happening there. This is outside Boston. It's actually in Boston. It's right, right outside Cambridge. But, again, that connection is really real. It's happening. They're growing, you know. The, the technology part is growing. So the word is getting out and people are reconnecting. And when they're connecting at these events, they're deciphering what works. Mm-hmm. And they're also pointing out those flagrant problems. You know, we're, we're watching capture rates drop and drop and drop. And, you know, okay, the, the national average is 64%. That's two percentage points away from capturing two thirds of the people. That's pretty good. That's great. It's also 14 points away from 50, 50. Right. And you and I are sitting here talking about people that leave with their prescriptions and walk out the door. So, mm-hmm. so these are things that really do connect uh, and hit home. And, and I think it's, uh, I think it's awesome that we're able to bring these things to the, to the forefront, talk about them openly as opticians, because a lot of the perspective of our industry uh, isn't necessarily through the eyes of those that are working face to face with patients in terms of eyeglasses. Mm-hmm. Mostly w- what I intend to talk about is the eyewear part of it. And um, we're certainly not going to neglect the contact lens element. They are the most rapidly, well, they were the most rapidly shrinking uh, part of the industry uh, for quite a few years. So uh, they've become very specialty 
uh, in my mind, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the existing contact lens business, but it is a very real profit center too. And technology is going to come with them. Practices deal differently with 1-800 contacts now than they did 10, 15 years ago. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, when you were introduced, when you first came in as an optician, that was a very weird procedure on how to handle and deal with that situation. And, and it was aggressive or ignore. Right. You know, we're not there anymore. So, and we're not there anymore because the technology pushed that envelope and it right. pushed it directly through the patient <laughs> right back to hit the practice in the face. <laughs> we're, we're all connected uh, digitally more than we've ever had been uh, right. with, with the, with the, you know, cell phone. Right. Everybody's got a computer in their pocket and everything is accessible to them. Why aren't we reaching them then? Right. There's, it, there's a direct link to your patient. Completely. And, you know, and, and this is the tip of a huge, huge, huge iceberg that, that I'm going to explore every corner of. And, uh, I it, think it needs to be, yeah, it, it does. It, it needs to be understood. Um, you know, because things, things are okay and things are going to happen and they're going to go down a certain direction, but there's also elements that need to be corrected and fixed. Patient orders set of glasses from Zenny. They don't work. They come in and, you know, Caesar, take care of this for, for me. These don't work, you know. Well, Caesar ought to be able to hand her, her him a business card and say, uh, this is where we're going to take care of it. You know, you're going to meet me remotely and we're going to get to the bottom of your problem. Right. But right now, I'm getting paid by the people behind me. <laughs> right. You know, I don't work for, I don't work for Zenny right now. <laughs> right. And this is how you're going to handle it with me. <laughs> you're going to meet me online independently and we're going to get to the bottom of your problem. You, you know? mentioned that. And I actually have a real life um, story that I was afforded the opportunity to dispense a pair of glasses to a woman who had um, mobility issues, who couldn't get a ride to the office, who couldn't, you know, right. um, move around very well. So I took it upon myself that, you know what? I'll go right to her house and I'll dispense her glasses. That's so awesome. And which triggered a whole nother wave of thoughts for me and, and went down this whole new idea of wouldn't it be cool to do that for a living? Right. You know, go right into the comfort of the home. And if you're not comfortable with somebody coming into your home, you can meet right. at a cafe, a brewery, a winery, uh, right. anywhere. But why aren't these things, you know, more out there and more spoken about that there is a population that that needs it? Again, there's needs out there that need to be met. It's our right. obligation to fulfill it. Yeah, there's more and more people that are just more comfortable um with services that come directly to them, regardless of where they are. And, and I, I think that that's, I think you, you, you hit on ultimately, which is probably a topic for a whole other program, but it's huge. Um, the mobile optician business that was teeny tiny in the nineties is not so tiny anymore. And there are ways to connect. There are ways to provide, uh, for these folks in a, in a large a large capacity and a very individualized capacity and you can hand pick your clients, which is uh, huge, absolutely right. massive. You know, I mean, you get to interact with what you are expecting to interact with. You know? Well, and within, within that too, a very big question comes like uh, insurance, third-party payers, things like that. Well, there's ways right. to, uh, to, I wouldn't say skirt around it, but to fulfill those there's programs out there. Those requirements. Yep. You know, and it's what, and the beauty of that is you can do it or you can just accept just cash check or charge. And, right. you know, and, but again, it's well, what direction do you want to take? Exactly. I had a mobile optical business uh, back in the nineties and, and in the early two thousands, I sold it and I think it's still working in the Baltimore area. I found it to be a little bit more of a labor of love uh, than it was financially rewarding, shall we say. Uh, but 
you're right. Uh, there was definitely a, uh, a connection there that, you know, I, for me, I had, I had a challenging time chase, chasing down the dollars, but I don't think that's, I don't think that's so much the case anymore. I think that uh, there's a lot of insurance integration now for even like you talked about for billing for mobile, which is a totally different animal. Um, right. And it should be because it is different. It's not the same, you know? Well, when you, when you started your, or when you had your mobile business, what's the biggest mm -hmm. difference then versus now technology? Right. Completely. Yeah, the availability, uh, even towards the end of the years, from the beginning when I launched in the early '90s towards the, you know, the, the late '90s, early 2000s, we were auto refracting, and we didn't have that capacity. You know, little handheld auto refractors began to balloon out because ophthalmology was entering, you know, assisted living and nursing facilities at, at a at, at a rapid rate. You know we were there to provide the glasses component and, you know, just base refraction and base health, you know, but it was, you know, you're right. The, the, the biggest challenge and the biggest change from day one through the end and still going today is technological advancement, you know, and it's not going to stop. It's not going to stop there. It's not going to stop in private practice and it isn't going to stop in, in any retail environment, any ophthalmology environment. You know? And we know this. So, Hey, this has been a fantastic conversation. I foresee us having future conversations about topics right along these lines. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time, Caesar. Uh, again, my name is Peter Precht. Uh, our podcast is Optometry Profits Revealed. And if any of these topics hit home and, and you feel that you would like to have a little bit further discussion with me about that, please visit icclearly.com and enter your information to contact us, send us an email and we'll set up a discussion with you. Thank you so much for your time. Have a wonderful week and take good care, Caesar. Thanks again. Really appreciate it. Thanks for it. having me, Peter. It's a pleasure.